Hello everybody, welcome to the Paul Maver Show on awakeradio.co.uk. Thank you. You're listening to awakeradio.us, awakeradio.co.uk, and shazizradio.com. Hi, I'm Paula, and this is Paula Live. Hello, you're listening to Awake yeah. Radio and Paula Live. I have my guest, Mike Cutler, retired of the INS, excuse me, INS agent. I, I'm not doing well speaking today, uh, Mike. You're going to really have to. <laughs> okay, out. well. Say hello and tell we'll, us a bit we'll, about We'll yourself. put you in a wheelbarrow and drag you along. <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> Thank you for having me on your show. Oh, love having you. Tell tell everybody who you are and what you're about. <clears throat> okay, sure. My name is Mike Cutler. I'm a retired senior special agent of what used to be the Immigration and Naturalization Service. I'm a New Yorker. Um, I began my career with the INS back in 1971 as an immigration inspector. I was assigned to Kennedy International Airport, New York City. Did that job for about four years. I, I wrote a, I wrote a, um, a deposition to help the, the state of Arizona when they were outrageously sued by the U.S. Department of Justice for enacting their own immigration laws. And I described my tenure at Kennedy Airport as having had my eye to the peephole on America's front door because that's really what immigration is about, about being careful as to who we let into our country, or at least that's what it's supposed to be about. But for one of those four years, um, I was detailed to the unit that did the marriage interviews to see if an alien is truly living with their American spouse so that they'd be entitled to a green card. You know, we've seen that in the movies. Uh, I did that job for real for about wow. a year. Uh, one of the most interesting cases I had, this is kind of funny, and I think your audience might find it humorous, uh, I tripped upon a, a loving couple. The guy was a ship jumper from China who spoke no English. He worked in a, in a kitchen at a Chinese restaurant in New York. His darling bride was less than half his age. She was of Puerto Rican ancestry. Only spoke English and Spanish, but no Chinese, so they spoke no common language. Um, if you saw the way this gal was dressed, it was uh, interesting, I guess, is the best way I can describe it. Um, uh, <laughs> she was wearing mesh stockings, you know, super high heel shoes, a tiny little micro mini skirt, um, spiked black and purple hair. Um, very Where well endowed so young lady with everything hanging out. <laughs> it turned out she was a prostitute, and uh, the lawyer had arranged the marriage, not just with, with this couple, but with a whole bunch of other uh, Chinese seamen who had jumped ship. We ultimately successfully prosecuted the attorney for arranging fraud marriages, and it was a media circus. I mean, it had, this case had a little bit of everything for everybody. It involved the Chinese community. You're writing a book about some of your um, <laughs> experiences, because just I'd love to, to but you have to find I've a had. publisher. <laughs> I'd love to, but you know what, Paula? You have to be able to find a publisher. And I will tell you that the prejudice against immigration enforcement has become so strong because of so many of the lies being spewed by so many of our alleged leaders and so many of our alleged journalists. And our immigration laws are the most significant and the most common sense of any laws that are contained in the, in the federal statutes. Look, at, at their foundation, America's immigration laws, and the immigration laws of most countries, are designed to do just a couple of things, and basically it comes down to national security, protect national security, protect public health and public safety, and protect the jobs of American workers. That's why we have immigration laws. And most people don't realize that prior to the Second World War, the administration and enforcement of America's immigration laws were the responsibility of the Labor Department. That's how we built America's middle class, by making certain that we did not subject American workers to foreign competition, which would inevitably drive down wages, displace Americans, and result in, in wage suppression. And because of the greed of so many people today, um, you know, we talked off the air earlier when you introduced yourself to me, and I told you there was an article in the Washington Times within the last couple of weeks reporting on how, and I believe it was Princeton and another 
first-rate university had done a study and came to the you know, startling, uh, unsettling conclusion that we no longer have a republic in the United States, but an oligarchy. And when you look at the way that campaign, campaign finance is being done, when you realize that campaign finance has become little more than legal bribery, 60 Minutes just did a piece on how the politicians are able to play the games, to take the money that's not supposed to go into their own personal pockets, but do. Uh, you know, as a federal agent, I was unable, I was not allowed to take a cup of coffee. If I came to your house because your neighbor was a person of interest to me because of my official duties, and if I said, you know, I want to learn about that guy that lives two doors down from you in that big white corner on the building, if you had said to me, Mike, we're having coffee and cake, why don't you sit down, we'll be glad to talk to you, the response that I was expected to come up with, and I can assure you I always did come up with that response, was I appreciate your offer of hospitality, but a glass of ice water would be perfect. And we did that to keep the public at arm's length so that people never thought that they could get special favors because suddenly I'd become their buddy. Uh, certainly I had buddies off duty, yeah. but on duty you needed to have that arm's length kind of insulation. And now we've got politicians taking how much money? And you don't think that there's an expectation that in exchange for that money, uh, that favors will be given? Uh, I mean, you know, I was born on a Wednesday, Paula, but not last Wednesday. What do you think? Uh, I love the way you put things. I love your analogies because they, they leave us, you know, right with the picture of exactly what's going on. Well, that's right. You and know, it's their coffee and cake they're being offered. Now they're friends kind of thing and they're buddies, and you're going yep. you're gonna to show me favor. We've yep, and now together. imagine what, if it, and if the concern is what a cup of coffee can do, what do tens of thousands of dollars do? What does use of your private airplane do? And, and so, you know, we need to understand that we are dealing with people who have a problem with, with scruples, with morality. Now, that's not to say every politician is crooked or, or, or whatever. I'm sure there are many of them who aren't the crooked, who are honorable. I can tell you that there are a couple of people in Washington who I am proud to consider a friend. Congressman Lou Barletta, the uh, guy from Hazleton, Pennsylvania, has become a good friend of mine. Um, he was the mayor of Hazleton, Pennsylvania, before he became the congressional representative for that community. And I was his final witness because he had enacted America's first local immigration ordinances to protect the members of his town against a Dominican drug gang that had set up shop at this community. They were shooting people, drugs were being sold, robberies were suddenly happening. This was in a very bucolic, quiet, former mining town in the hills of Pennsylvania. Beautiful area. It, it, it's a picture book setting. And to their horror, this once quiet community suddenly fell vi victim to this violence. And this was under the administration of George W. Bush. Understand something, folks. This isn't about one party over the other. I'm a registered lifelong Democrat. I'm a labor guy. Immigration is not a conservative issue. It's not a, it's not a liberal issue. It's an American issue. You know, just because you're, you're liberal or conservative doesn't mean you want to enter into a suicide pact. You want to live a safe life, and you want the best for your children and their children. That's what most sensible people want. We may have different ideas about the best way of arriving at that destination, but at the end of the day, if you went up to somebody and said, if you had a magic wand, what would you want for America? And most people would tell you they want America to be strong, they want their lives to be safe, they want opportunities for their children. That's what most people want. But we may, again, have a different idea and the best way of achieving those goals, but those are the reasonable goals that sensible people would have for America, or for any and country for that matter. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So the immigration you know, somebody laws, once said they would. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, that's right. Somebody once said that there'd be no war if the old generals had to go out and fight the wars themselves instead of sending young kids into battle. Maybe there's some truth to that. I agree. Yeah. Well. And, and you know, when you look at the sociopaths, and, and you know, but let me go back to my career just briefly, and then I, I want to get to the meat of the matter. And you're, you're, you've been gracious enough to give me the two hours to spend with you, so we. We will have a good amount of time. And, and I have to tell you something. This is why I love, love, love radio. 
when you go on TV, you do a three and a half minute piece. I, I did a, I did do an almost eight minute piece with Megyn Kelly over at Fox News May second of last year when we talked about the Boston Marathon bombing. But that was unusual. And eight minutes really isn't enough time. It comes and it goes quickly. They're on to the next topic. Here we can have an honest-to-God conversation. We can really explore the issues. Um, and I will tell you, you don't need to see my ugly mug on your screen as long as I can get my voice out there. And I appreciate you providing me with the opportunity. <laughs> and 7 o'clock New York time, I'll be doing my own program this evening, the Michael Cutler Hour, worthwhile watching. And while we're talking about that stuff, I'll put two yes, websites let them out know there. Yes, know how to find you. Mike. Sure. Absolutely. I, I, believe me, I need to find myself. I'm lost. I really feel lost in America <laughs> these days. I'm glad I found you. <laughs> 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 My own personal website is michaelcutler.net, C-U-T-L-E-R, Michael Cutler, M-I-C-H-A-E-L, one word, michaelcutler.net. I also write for a terrific organization, though, is Californians for Population Stabilization. Um, they're out on the West Coast. California is being hammered because of the uh, overflow of illegal aliens, and not just across the Mexican border, and we'll get into that in a bit also, but they've really gotten nailed by all of this. Their website, capsweb.org, C-A-P-S, capsweb.org. I write for them, as do many other people. But really, I feel that my job is that of Mythbuster. And I think that my perspectives that I've acquired in almost 43 years now blows my mind. It's been so much time, which I guess accounts for all my gray and now white hair, um, has given me a vantage point most people don't have. Um, you know, 1974. Life life experience, on-the-job training. Um, <laughs> uh, in 1975, I became what used to be called a criminal investigator. We call that job a special agent. I tripped over a terrorist plot uh, in Israel back in 1976. We prevented it. Um, in 1981, I actually approached Senator Aldemano about changing the immigration law to make unlawful reentry of criminals, people who'd committed rape and murder, arson, sold narcotics, uh, engaged in gun running, to make it a 20-year crime. So we hear the lies wow, from the politicians. Wow, you think that would just happen? You know, you think that's... People would like to think they're already being protected, that that wouldn't have to require... Well, the laws know. don't matter if they're not enforced. You see, I was going to be an engineer originally. Science is, is, is my passion. And what I love about the laws of nature is that they're immutable. The speed of light is not determined by a guy with a radar gun in a summons book. The speed of light is. Man's laws without enforcement are meaningless. So very often you will see members of Congress enact legislation to create laws that we probably don't even need half the time. But whether or not they fund the law and to what extent they fund the enforcement of the law determines whether or not the law will be meaningful. And sometimes we see that the lack of enforcement leads to disastrous situations, so we react accordingly. Let me give you a good example, because I know you were about to ask okay. me if I could give you an example. <laughs> I was. Look at the drunk driving laws. Uh, I remember as a kid in New York, Friday and Saturday nights were deadly, literally, figuratively. You got on the highway, you'd be zipping along at 60 miles an hour, and all of a sudden the traffic would slow to a crawl, and you'd work your way through the traffic, and there would be some guy nodding out behind the wheel doing S-turns, going from the left lane to the right lane to the middle lane to the left lane, and everybody was scared to death to get near him. Uh, I did a little single-engine flying as a kid. I remember one day waiting at a red light the morning after my first solo flight, and people told me how dangerous flying was. Well, there I was waiting at a red light, 1971. I had a Dodge Challenger. Uh, and it had, I used to call it the snake pit, all those separate belts, because today we have that one-piece harness. Back then there were separate belts. You had to hook them together. But I did, oh, because gosh. it made sense to me. And I was waiting in a red light, and this yo-yo, drunker than a skunk, flew into me at 70 miles an hour through my car about 200 feet. And I thought I was on fire, because I looked in the mirror and saw it was the steam of his radiator. His car looked like a bomb had gone off under the hood. My car buckled in the middle. I broke the headrest with my head. That's how bad the impact was. And he was drunk, and the police didn't want to arrest him, and they didn't. So I drove the wreckage I home incredibly. I back when that was almost an excuse. That's how old I am. Yes. I, yeah, well, well you and me drunk. both. Oh, I remember well, John Wayne. Yeah. 
Sure, John Wayne on the Tonight Show. I remember him joking with Johnny Carson and saying, well, Johnny, I was in the elevator after that party, and I was so drunk. And, you know, Carson did that, how drunk were you? He says, well, I couldn't figure out what button to push to get to the garage. And the audience is roaring. Oh. And then he says, you know what, Johnny, I got in my car. I have no recollection of the drive, but God was my co-pilot because next morning when I got up, I walked around the car, and you know what? I hadn't had an accident. And everybody thought this was hysterical. They laughed Because it lied. was the perception that this drunk behind the wheel. It's part of life. Today, of course, we lock people up. And when it, it was found that it wasn't working, they amped up enforcement. They, they established sobriety checkpoints. They started imposing strict fines and other sanctions against people caught drunk driving, seizing vehicles, hitting people with hundreds of dollars in fines. Well, the message was clear. If you drink and drive, you get caught, you're in a world of hurt, even if you don't have an accident. They lowered the acceptable blood alcohol level. Here in New York, there was a street, Queens Boulevard, that became known as the Boulevard of Death. It's a huge expanse of highway. I mean, you've got to see how big it is. It's three lanes of traffic in each direction, then a little concrete island, then parking on both sides of that, and you can still drive through that side street that it's on both sides. So we're talking, I don't know, 12, 14 lanes wide. And some people are trying to cross the street, especially the elderly, would find that they never had enough time to make it to the other side. And because people were speeding, some of these folks didn't make it home either. They became hood ornaments on cars going by at warp speed. Yeah, the solution? No empathy, right? They, 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 they enforced the law. They put up big signs telling people how fast they're going. And sitting behind each sign is a police car with the motor going. Now, that cop were just waiting for the opportunity to nail somebody dumb enough to go by there at, 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 at too fast a speed. Well, by doing that... We were averaging two and sometimes three deaths a week. It stopped. No more death. Why? People knew there were adverse consequences. So now we come to immigration. And I realized that we needed to enforce the law and that the laws were worth enforcing. Whether we were arresting people working illegally in factories because they were taking jobs Americans needed, whether we were arresting bad guys, uh, you know, in 1988, I was the first immigration agent assigned to the Unified Intelligence Division of the Drug Enforcement Administration in New York. 1991, I was promoted to the position of senior special agent assigned to the Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force. I had desks at the FBI, DEA, ATF. I worked with uh, British Customs and uh, Royal Canadian Mounted Police from Canada. I got an award from the government of Japan. I worked with the Israeli National Police. We worked with all sorts of other law enforcement agencies uh, cooperatively to go after the drug trafficking, the human trafficking, transnational criminals, terrorists. Um, and now we've come to the point where the politicians recognize that corporations want cheap Labor, And, you know, America's always had an insatiable appetite for cheap labor. Think about slavery. And now, of course, today, if you dare say mm -hmm. we should enforce those laws, you're accused of being anti-immigrant. Well, We're not. What, We're pro-enforcement. If you say think again, about it, you said it just starts, you know, it started out <clears throat> being a way to protect uh, jobs. And yep. now it's come into, uh, you know... We have a really bad sex slave trade. We have a really bad immigration labor slave trade going yep. on. And, and it, has, it has blown into so many different categories when you talk about immigration. And, you know, because I, I even know people who have come over here in a, a marriage uh, as a money changed hands. And I even yep. know of someone that done it. After they got here, their granddaughter was married to the tune of ten thousand dollars. I mean, yep. I I, I uh, called the police and here it's not and about said, Mexico. you know, my, I, my my this person I know has arranged a marriage for her granddaughter for ten thousand dollars. Well, that's not illegal. Is the girl saying she's going to do it? Well, yeah. Well, then happy marriage. <laughs> so it, you is, know, it, it, it is it went illegal. from protecting jobs to. Wow, look how much immigration, how many categories there are now. But understand that getting married for money is, is a crime. 
getting married for money is a crime if the people aren't living together. That's a felony. Uh, well, we lock she, people up for doing his, that. She was his uh, bride. She did end up running away and leaving. She got really thin. She was really, uh, uh, this was a young girl that was told, Mary, yeah. help your family overseas or we'll throw your clothes out in the street. You know, so, you know. And, there's a lot of uh, coercion, there's a lot of harm done. And ask if that was legal, and I was told they, they, they weren't interested in it. So. Well, right, it's, but you see, it's against the law, but if they're not interested, it's all about mind over matter. If the government doesn't mind, it doesn't matter. Or as Hillary Clinton so go. eloquently would say, what difference does it make? You know, I, I've got a, a funny image for you. You know, we've all been following the Oscar Pastorius case, the Blade Runner case in South Africa. Paula, could you imagine if Oscar Pastorius stood up in court during the trial and used the Hillary defense? She's dead. What difference does it make? Exactly. See, the arrogance that we get from our politicians is infuriating. But you know what? I don't blame Hillary Clinton. I blame the American people. The politicians have been able to literally get away with murder. You know, we all start out with a new job at some point in our lives. The first day you go to work and you make sure your shoes are polished and your shirt is pressed. You wear your favorite tie and you polish up your cufflinks and boy you want to make that impression you're supposed to be there at 8.30 but you show up at 8.05 and they tell you you can take an hour for lunch but you, you take you know 40 minutes for lunch and, and, you, and you work it. past 5 o'clock and you say you know I'm going to show my and pretty soon you realize that your boss doesn't care one day you're stuck on the train and you don't walk in until 9 o'clock instead of 8.30 and your boss smiles and says, hey, how you doing, Paul? Everything good? Yeah, I was like, oh, don't worry about it. I don't care. Oh, really? <laughs> that wow. That changes things. So, just to think what happens. Then one day you come to work if you're a guy and you say, boy, I hate this necktie. Just don't, it's hot out. You don't take the, and, and the boss doesn't say to you, gee, where's your tie? He says, oh, how you doing, Charlie? Oh, I'm doing great. Good, good, good to see you. Thanks for coming in today. And dress like a slob. He doesn't care. So now Friday rolls around, you think, well, you know what? I'm going to go out with my buddies tonight. Why should I wear a suit? I'm going to wear blue jeans and sneakers. Let's see what I can get away with. And your boss pats you on the back and says, hey, good to see you. Everything good? Yeah, fine. Great. Have a nice day. I'm going to head back up to my office. You get that work done for me, okay? Well, I guess the dress code no longer matters in this office. No and then you take code. a little it's extra casual. longer lunch. Yeah. yeah but but understand what starts to happen. So over see time. see how you can get what? What but you can get away with. There. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, I want everybody to understand something. We've all heard the expression about how we only have one opportunity for a first impression, correct? A first impressions are very important, aren't they? Absolutely. So we have, we have a president of the United States who says, if you run the border, we want to put you on a pathway to citizenship. Now, just stop everybody and think about that statement. And it's not just him, it's Chuck Schumer, it's Harry Reid, it's John McCain, it's both sides of the aisle, it's Nancy Pelosi, right? And they say, wait a minute, not only are they going to let me stay, they're going to give me citizenship. Wow, that's like stealing a car and being told that you earned the right to the registration of the car. How did you earn it? By stealing it. Wow, why should I ever buy a car again when I could just take one and they're going to tell me I earned it because I, you know, so what's the first impression aliens have of the United States? I will tell you what the first laws are that they generally encounter. It's our immigration laws. The message has been sent out far and wide, and I made this point when I testified last March before the Senate Judiciary Committee, that they have fired the starter's pistol by these statements. And for these aspiring illegal aliens from around the world, the finish line to this race is the border of the United States of America. And they're not just running the Mexican border. That's a subterfuge. That's a way of distracting us. The Mexican border is certainly very important. It's the only place on the planet where the first world collides with the third world. So there's an awful lot of pressure on that border. We know there's corruption and drugs and all kinds of problems in Mexico. That border has to be made secure. I don't want somebody saying, oh, Cutler said the border doesn't matter. No, the border certainly does matter. But securing that Mexican border is kind of like a wing on an airplane. 
Without the wing, the airplane certainly is not going to fly. But if all you have is the wing, you're not going anywhere either. We have to have all of the elements of the immigration system working effectively with integrity. Well, I mean, look what happened on Calais when uh, we talked earlier in uh, yeah the Calais deception. Let me let me educate you for those who are not familiar with the Second World War with some of the history, and this goes to the brilliance of one of my favorite. Uh, American presidents and, and military leaders, Dwight Eisenhower, a guy with real integrity. Do you know that Dwight Eisenhower, by the way, I'm going to go off a tiny bit, but Eisenhower actually built the highway system as a matter of national security. In fact, sometimes you'll notice on the interstate highways in the United States, you will see five stars. Do you know why that shows five stars? Because Eisenhower was a five-star general. And that's why you'll see five stars. It was Eisenhower's... Uh, it was, yeah, it was part of his um, defense budget because he felt that this was a matter of national defense. He had learned that lesson from the Germans because that's why they built the Autobahns. Nobody understood when they built the Autobahns why those overpasses were so high that you could move tanks. And that's why they built their overpasses that high to accommodate the tanks. So when Hitler decided to mobilize, because remember, you know, he, he was in a landlocked country, so if he was going to move outside his own country, he needed to be able to move the tanks. So where did he move them? He was able to move them on the autobahns. So I I've guess I never Eisenhower... heard that before. Thank you. Wow. Yeah, oh, that, but that's why we should be studying history. I hated history in school because it was never taught properly. Absolutely. History, and you know, I when we learned there's about Thomas about Jefferson. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, it was part of no. It was part of an overarching strategy. Look, Hitler was brilliant. He was he was crazy. He was a sociopath. The Third Reich killed my, my, my mother's family. I was named for my grandmother who perished in Poland. I don't say this with any admiration whatsoever. But never presume your enemy is stupid, because that's the way to lose. Always figure your enemy is more potent and smarter than you might ever imagine to make certain. I, I would rather have bullets left over after a gunfight than run out of ammunition. Always figure that your opponent will be worse than, you, than he might be. Never underestimate your opponents. Absolutely. And so apparently Hitler, Hitler, doesn't that make sense? Absolutely. So in, 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 so in any event, what, um, what Eisenhower did was he said, look, if we're going to invade through Normandy, which became D-Day, June 6, 1944, We've got to confuse the Germans so that they don't know where we're coming from because if they mass all of their forces along the beaches of Normandy, we can't get through. So what did they do? They created a phantom army and convinced the Nazis we were going to come through Calais. They even put General George S. Patton in charge of a non-existent division. And they created inflatable tanks and inflatable trucks. They were all props. But from the air, they looked like the real McCoy, and it convinced the Germans we were coming through Calais. They divided their, their resources, and we were able to make it through Normandy. Of course, it was a bloodbath for those poor souls who died on the beach. But we succeeded. That was the turning point in the war. It was through this Calais deception, also known as Operation Fortitude. Today, we're being told... Once the Mexican border is secure, then we can give illegal aliens identity documents, lawful status. Well, let's back up a moment. First of all, it's estimated that at least 40% of the illegal aliens in our country did not run the Mexican border but came in through ports of entry. See, we have 50 border states. Whenever I do public speaking events, I always like to ask people, how many border states are there? And nine out of ten people, Paul, it's the funniest thing, they start looking at the fingers on their hands as though there's a map somehow written maybe in their palm. <laughs> and they go, well, it's California. And then the guy turns to his wife and says, Mabel, what's that state next to California? And she goes, New Mexico? Ah, yeah, okay. So it's California. New and then they tell you Arizona, Texas. Baloney. Any state that is on the northern or southern border any state that has access to our 95,000 miles of meandering coastline, any state that has an international airport is a border state. And never forget something else. When aliens do run the borders, they don't come the way that Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin went to the moon. They're not here to put their feet on our side of the border, grab a couple of rocks, plant the flag, and leave. 
they're headed for the rest of the country. We have a huge illegal Mexican population in New York City. Mexico is not too close to New York last time I looked at the map. So, you know, understand what we're dealing with. This is a, a national problem. <clears throat> but again, by convincing people it's just about four border states, most people are very selfish. Most people, you know, are grammatically challenged. They can only conjugate verbs in the first person singular. So they say, well, if I'm living in Chicago, why should I care about what's happening in Texas? If I live in New Jersey, why should I care what's happening in New Mexico? It's crazy. It was so bad, this mentality, that when I did one of my congressional hearings before the House Immigration Subcommittee, and I had some journalists who actually called me up, I will spare you and your audience the, the language I use because I don't want to melt your earwax. But this <laughs> Nimrod calls me up from Associated Press a year after 9-11. He says, well, they, they blew up the towers in New York and they hit the Pentagon, but huh, I'm in Ohio, not my problem, but now they just found this guy that wants to blow up the mall when my wife and kids go shopping every weekend. And I said, so the fact that the World Trade Center was reduced to rubble isn't a big deal because you're not a New Yorker? And he didn't quite know how to answer me. So I strongly suggested, if you could follow along with this concept, that he attempt an anatomical impossibility. Use your imagination. Okay? I was furious. And so I, when I went before that hearing, I said to Chairman Hostetler, yeah. who at the time was the chairman, and I said, I want a map of the United States with a dot on every city that lost a person who lived in that town who died on 9-11. And know, the map had dots all over it. People even listening to the it. station know that anything that affects one of us affects us worldwide. And this guy That's right. is saying and it didn't state? happen to my, in my state. Oh, my God. That, and this guy's a journalist, no. a journalist, a journalist. so-called. Well, there you go. So go. what I said at that hearing is no American city is safe if any American city is attacked. We've got to understand, folks, as Ben Franklin said, we either hang together or we most assuredly will hang separately. Uh, I mean, this is lunacy, this selfishness. I, I mean, since when did pulling out of a parking space become competition sport? But today it is, because people are grammatically challenged. The only three people that they think about are me, myself, and I. We've got to understand that we're in this together. And what's happening is this game of divide and conquer. And you hear it on all the news programs, and I don't care what network. Well, if the president wants to appeal to this group or that group, if John Boehner wants to appeal to the conservative base of the Republican Party, then he can't go along with comprehensive reform. And you sit there listening to that. And, and you know, I, I want all of you folks to give some thought to thinking things differently today. Forget all the garbage and all the propaganda and all the news speak you've been hearing in the media. Look at it differently. We know that people get upset when they hear about profiling. If you engage in racial profiling and you are a um, police officer, if you're a federal agent, you're probably going to get sued. And the journalists are going to go on TV very sanctimoniously and beat you up. What is wrong with that guy? He stopped him because he's black. He stopped him because he's white. He stopped, you know. Well, if a cop does that, of course, if that's all you're looking at, there's something terribly wrong, unless you were told we're looking for a suspect who is a white male about five foot nine and he's wearing a gray jacket, um, you know, it's reasonable then that you're looking for a white guy or, or a black guy or whatever matches the description. But other than that, that's true. But usually profiling in law enforcement is justified if you take situational stuff into account. Uh, example, if you have a white guy in a predominantly black neighborhood driving a car with out-of-town plates in the middle of the night, going down a block where drugs are being sold, and he turns off the headlights as he comes down the block, probably something's going on you need to talk to. Are you profiling? Sure you are, but it makes sense. And in those conditions, I think even the most... Um, uh, concerned person about civil rights would agree, yeah, that makes sense. But these same journalists who have a cow, if there's even a hint of profiling, are the same journalists that will go from a law enforcement story, and you know how they go from one story to the next with no rhyme or reason to any of it, and then they will talk about the Latino. 
big smile. Yes, the big the big toothpaste grin, and then they talk about you know it's like you know it's, it's like a bunch of yo-yos standing in front of a camera. Pretty remarkable passes for serious journalism. Uh, I mean, Walter Cronkite and uh, and Harry Reasoner and Edward R. Murrow must be pinwheeling in their graves over what passes for journalism today. But and, and with all the happy talk and all the goofy nonsense, um, imagine that they, the same people that scream about profiling then turn to the next news report about politics, and they say something like, well, if John Boehner wants to get the Latino vote, and you sit there and you say, wait a minute. What in the world is the Latino vote? I made this point when I spoke at the Tea Party convention. And, you know, for all of this nonsense about we're going to put pit, uh, Democrat against Republican, conservative against liberal, my neighbors who are Democrats, and I'm a Democrat, and the people at the Tea Party in South Carolina know I'm a Democrat. Joe Dugan and I have become friends. I was on the phone with Joe just yesterday. He invited me to speak at three Tea Party events in Myrtle Beach as his turf, so to speak. And I've always been given prime time. In fact, the first time I spoke, uh, this was during the presidential campaign three years ago when they were revving up. And um, Santorum spoke, Gingrich spoke. I was on stage as Gingrich was leaving. They gave me 25 minutes. This is about being American, folks. We're supposed to disagree. It's in our political DNA. The First Amendment isn't just about freedom of speech, press, and religion. It's about the right to seek redress of grievances. And by God, if you don't have grievances... Today, you better check for a flatline EEG. And it's also about the right for peaceable assemblage, because the founding fathers understood that discourse, debate, argument, uh, it's a part of the process. All they said is do it peaceably, leave your guns, your clubs, and your knives at home, but then have at it. So this idea that That's if I disagree with you, I'm your enemy is crazy. I'm sorry? Exactly. That's what we say at Awake. <laughs> But that's right. I mean, but we're supposed to have those disagreements. And you never know your own position better than when you have to defend it against someone who disagrees with you. And if you can't withstand that debate, maybe you need to change your opinion. Exactly. Think about it. So in any event, we're being fed a lot of pablum. They talk about the Latino vote. Now, I want all of you to understand what we're saying. If somebody says... If you want the Latino vote, single vote, that means anybody who is a Latino is going to think and act and be concerned about the same exact issues as everyone else from that same ethnic group. What do you think? Might that be a little bit of profiling going on? Might it not be a little bit outrageous that everybody whose last name is Garcia is going to march lockstep with everybody else? Or everybody who wears a Star of David, anyone whose name is Goldstein, is going to vote the same exact way? Or anybody oh, with yeah. black skin is going to vote like all the other blacks? Really? Well, aren't they you all mean alike? there's no difference? Oh, I mean, is Paula, am I crazy or does this make you sick to your stomach? Sick to my stomach. How many of you folks listening to this program ever gets, gave thought to the lies and the bigotry and the hate-mongering that goes behind that statement, the Latino vote? Think how damn disgusting it is. More what in the world are they talking about? Drawing yes, on. that's like saying those people, those people. Yes, and I, I will all, tell you, I have friends. They're all the clone of one thought in one way because yes. they're this color, you know. Yep, and, and, and when they do that, and these are the same self-righteous purveyors of the truth, and we know they wouldn't lie or get it wrong, they journalists. Oh, no. oh, the Latino vote. How will the Republicans get the Latino? You don't think that there are conservatives who are Latinos? I know many people, great Americans, who are conservative and Latino, and some of them are fourth, fifth, sixth generation America. My friend Al Garza, if Al's listening to the program, was in the United States um, Marine Corps, and he's Tex-Mex. He's born in the United States. His family ancestry goes back to Mexico. He was American at birth, and he served with distinction in the Marine Corps. I believe his father was in the Marine Corps. We now have people convinced that if your last name is a Latino last name, you're probably an illegal alien. Talk about destroying people's reputations and altering in a very negative and hostile way people's perceptions of fellow Americans. 
You mean exactly. every Latino wants illegal aliens to enter the United States because that's who their family is? Really? If this doesn't anger you and disgust you, uh, you need to have your moral compass repaired. Bring it to the repair shop this weekend. So we listen to this nonsense. And, and you know, when I do public speaking events, um, most of the places I work with, most of the speakers, bear don't let you use PowerPoint. And I hate PowerPoint. And, you know, the joke I have is that when I was a young kid, uh, if I met a pretty young lady and I wanted her phone number, we didn't even have PowerPoint back then. And I generally got the phone number. So if I didn't need PowerPoint then, I don't need it now. But we do need to use the PowerPoint of words. So I'm going to give you folks an image. If you've ever played with a little puppy dog or a little kitten, and we've all done this, and it's kind of fun. You have a little flashlight, you shine the light on the floor, and you see the little critter go scampering after that light. I think of John Boehner in his fancy suit on all fours, but instead of the light, he's chasing this mythical Latino vote. How's that for an image? Chasing that it's light. You know, the, I love your analogy. I mean, this is, doesn't it work? And how disgusting is it? How insulting is this to great Americans who happen to have Latino ethnicity? Why are we doing this? How is it that Americans are tolerating what should be intolerable? You know, I did a debate at a college university, a college campus. My debate partner is a former agent that I worked with for a bunch of years, real good guy. And uh, he got his Ph.D. in sociology, and he said, Mike, can you participate in this debate with me? So we debated a, um, an immigration lawyer and this woman who was a professor originally born in Peru. And uh, one of the tactics that the other side uses is to label their opponents. See, my language that I use doesn't change. The term alien is the term alien. I don't change it. It doesn't become undocumented. It doesn't become unauthorized. And by the way, the word alien, for those of you who are cringing, and I've asked people, what do you think of the word alien? Oh, it's a terrible word. Why? Well, they say. I'm still trying to meet that person, they say. I guess they is the first name and say is the last name, they say. I, I, never, get a, uh, I never get a clear answer to the question, and who are they? And who are they? Exactly. So they say alien's a bad word, and they say, well, do you know what it means? Uh, gee, I, I never gave it any thought. Wait a minute. You're willing to discard a, la a word in the English language without even considering what it means. Well, let me tell you what the legal definition of the word alien is, Paula. And I'll tell you what, you're, you're in Florida, right? If I get down to Florida, I'll buy you dinner if you can tell me where the insult is in this definition. And this isn't Mike Cutler's definition. <laughs> this is the definition contained in the Immigration and Nationality Act, that body of law that we enforce and administer that deals with aliens entering the country and aliens present in the country. The term alien, any person not a citizen or national of the United States. That's the whole definition. Is there an insult in that definition? Any person not a citizen or national of the United States. Where's the insult? Does it say stupid, smells bad, immoral, corrupt, <laughs> anything like that? No. I don't you're not a citizen of the United States and you're here. How is that an insult? How is that a terrible word? Why are newspapers removing that from print? Why are the television stations refusing to use the word alien? The Constitution talks about unalienable rights or the Declaration of Independence, right? Unalienable. Are we supposed to change that to undocumented or something? Well, what in the world are we doing? Now, it's now by the way, a, we have to discard. But to show you how twisted this, but here's the thing: <laughs> Do you know it you've heard of the Dream sense. Act, haven't you? You've yeah. heard the Dream Act, right? That the, the okay. Do you know what the A in Dream is? Alien. Suddenly, the word alien became palatable because it was the phrase alien miners. By the way, alien miners, do you know the age cutoff for aliens to participate in the DREAM Act? That doesn't exist, by the way. The law never became the law. I testified before three hearings in the House and one in the Senate before uh, they, they tried to get it enacted in 07. So think about that. But do you know what the age cutoff is now that the president is doing with his Deferred Action Program that parallels the DREAM Act? No. We've been told this is about children and kids, right? Age cutoff is 31. Does that not take your breath away? 
Now, look, I'm on the wrong side <laughs> of 60, so 31 sounds awfully young to me. Me too. But a child? A child. Wow. I had no idea. Yes. Is that remarkable? Is that remarkable? It's a bit crazy. It's insane. It's insane. Now, here's another question. Here's another question. Do you know how long the interview is that aliens participating in this program will undergo? How careful the interview will be? I have no idea. There is no interview. It definitely is a dream act. It's a nightmare act. And there's nobody doing any investigations to make certain that people didn't lie on their applications. What could possibly go wrong? So now, let me go it back to something more that I have more said. It like a, a post office box in, uh, in a, a mall somewhere. Yep, and you know what? You have the mayor of New York, this new nitwit, de Blasio, who wants to give illegal aliens identity documents, even though we can't verify who they are. So let me read something to you. And, and you know, I gave testimony to the 9-11 Commission. I've testified before 16 congressional hearings. I've also been before several state legislative hearings around the country, New York, Maryland, uh, Texas. I've worked with Arizona. We got a law passed in Indiana. I've been all over the place trying to help out. Not because I'm a conservative. I don't know how in the world that is the perception, but because I'm an American. I'm a Democrat. So my question, and this should be the starting question, folks, whenever you confront a politician about comprehensive reform, you need to start with one fundamental question. Think about this one. Have you considered the findings and recommendations of the 9-11 Commission before you started having any discussion about any change to the immigration laws? Hold that thought in your mind. Hold that question in your mind. And I want you to know that there are two documents that should be on the table before anybody says the word immigration in Washington. One is the 9-11 Commission, uh, Commission report. The other one is the 9-11 Commission staff report on terrorist travel, a monograph. Now, here's the deal. The 9-11 Commission addressed the issue of terrorists using visas by fraud, by entering the country, by getting identity documents and driver's licenses. That's why the Real ID Act passed, but it was never really implemented or funded. But the staff that worked for the 9-11 Commission, the lawyers and the investigators, and the investigators were special agents, some of them were colleagues of mine, they realized that as much as the 9-11 Commission talked about immigration, they felt they didn't go far enough. Now, this was the staff that worked with the commissioners. They then issued their own separate and distinct report, the 9-11 Commission Staff Report on Terrorist Travel. So think about this. Their report was almost as big as the actual 9-11 Commission report. So how important do you think they figure immigration was in terms of our vulnerabilities, which led to the attacks of 9-11? Wow, Mike. An integral you know, part of it. I'm telling you, as as... I hope to have you on a lot because I have, as you're talking, I have questions that are going to even branch way out into your, and take you way off your topic, too. Um, sure. Because you know, right now, especially with a worldwide station, we have uh, um, people from all over the world hosting these shows, South Africa, right. we get to know what's going on over there in, uh, uh -huh. in uh, yep. you know, several places. And we also know a lot of good people that have are jumping through hoops and and it seems like it's the good people that have family here that are trying yep. to get over an immigration that are blocked i mean they're taking years and and uh well we'll totally talk about that I, I don't want i don't want to get off on a I, tangent yeah that's what i, I was saying i don't want to take you off of that but gosh i know we'll, we'll get, we'll get to some of those issues and, too but right now but right now i want to have a laser focus on this Yes, and I want I my audience I'm, I'm to terrible. stay focused. I'm, 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 I am okay. too. So I, I, I'll, please, please promise to come back on okay. other shows and, and do that. And, yeah, and, and I, I will. Right ahead. I will. I'm sorry to interrupt you. It's just oh no, no, no. Goodness. That's okay. But I want to make sure that we stay on topic because I, I want people to get this image in their mind. I want them to get their head into the game. And this Absolutely. is the game. Okay. 
absolutely. And 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 we left so off the two papers on the desk should be. Yep. Yeah, so the two the two reports and, and and you can get them for a very good price. My favorite price in the world. They're free online. I, I I often provide the link. Go to my website michaelcutler.net. I very often cite the 9/11 Commission report, the 9/11 Commission staff report on terrorist travel. Go to michaelcutler.net. Go to capsweb.org. Well, you can just look up the 9-11 Commission report, but I'd like you to read my articles because I think it'll give you the insight you're not going to hear on the mainstream media when they sit, sit before the cameras and lie their heads off. Yes, by the way, if you know anybody, if you know anybody who does plastic surgery, rhinoplasty, send them to visit our politicians, send them to visit our journalists, so-called. They need it. Their noses <laughs> are growing every time they... My television Pinocchio has become syndrome. a lie detector. <laughs> no, listen, my t the t our TVs are lie detectors. You turn it on, if you see these people talking, they're lying. Absolutely. Most it's of very us don't simple. even look at it anymore. But, uh, that's right, and that's why what you're doing is so important. But this was now the beginning of the preface to the 9-11 Commission staff report on terrorist travel. This pretty much paralleled what was in the beginning of what I gave them as written testimony. This is a short statement, folks, but I want you to really pay attention to what I'm about to say. This is the 9-11 Commission staff report, terrorist travel. This is the preface. This is the first words in this book. And it's a book. It's about 500 pages long, by the way. This isn't a tiny little pamphlet. And these are all deficiencies of the immigration system that we're ignoring completely now. In fact, going in the opposite direction, and I'll demonstrate that to you momentarily. It is perhaps obvious to state that terrorists cannot plan and carry out attacks in the United States if they are unable to enter the country. Yet prior to September 11, while there were efforts to enhance border security, no agency of the U.S. government thought of border security as a tool in the counterterrorism arsenal. Indeed, even after 19 hijackers demonstrated the relative ease of obtaining a U.S. visa and gaining admission into the United States, Border security still is not considered a cornerstone of national security policy. We believe for reasons we will discuss in the following pages that it must be made one. Now, they talked about visas. You should know that I did my very first congressional hearing on May 20th, 1997, four and a half years before the attacks of 9-11, four and a half years after the first attacks in the United States. January 1993, an individual by the name of Mir Amil Kansi, a Pakistani national, applied for political asylum, lied through his teeth, got himself into a business of running a courier van, which he used much the way that law enforcement uses a surveillance van in Virginia. He would drive by, as it turned out, constantly where the CIA headquarters was, scoping out the location because people don't see taxi cabs, they don't see school buses, they don't see ice cream trucks, they don't see courier trucks. They are kind of like a treehouse on top of a tree in a forest. People just see them as part of the landscape. We don't even pay attention to them, okay? He went to the CIA, I believe the date was January 26th. It was certainly January, and I believe it was the 26th. It was also February 26th, by the way, that the first bombing at the Trade Center happened. So this is about a month before the Trade Center bombing. He went by the CIA, and he had with him a, a, a toy, not really, an AK-47, fully loaded, jumped out of the van and machine gunned the cars being driven into the CIA parking lot. He killed two CIA officers, wounded three others, and fled the country. International criminals and terrorists have an escape hatch they can use. They can leave our country and go home, and usually that takes them outside the reach of the long arm of our law. But given the nature of this crime, our guys hunted him down like the dog that he was, found him in Pakistan, brought him back to the United States. He was ultimately found guilty and executed, but the people that he killed remained dead. The people he wounded remained wounded, injured. A month later, first attack, World Trade Center. Okay? Now, let me tell you something. They talk here about visas and the significance of visas. On 9-11, and, and the 9-11 Commission report said, we've got to tighten up the process by which we issue visas to foreign nationals who wish to visit the United States. The visa process is considered an integral component of national security, and you heard the recommendation in that paragraph about the visas. 
On 9-11, there were 26 visa waiver countries, countries whose citizens did not need to get a visa before entering the United States. Now we know, obviously, after the fact, that that visa process wasn't tight enough. So I'm going to ask you a question, Paula. We had 26 visa waiver countries on September 11, 2001. We now know that we we're giving out visas far too easily. So how many visa waiver countries do you think we have today? Hmm, I'm saying quite a bit. I would think probably over 100. No. We went from 26 to 38. But now Chile just became number 38 about six weeks ago, five weeks ago. But here's my question. If you don't need a visa, doesn't it obviate this whole process of we're going to tighten up the process by which we give out visas? Doesn't this go in exactly the opposite direction of what the 9-11 Commission said? It seems so the like obvious that's question all they is, well, do, though, at this point. Yes, and there's a reason. That's why my number but was high. Just, it's not... <laughs> yeah, but, but, but why do you think this is happening? Because the United States Chamber of Commerce has partnered with the travel, hospitality, and hotel industries to create a program known as the Discover America Partnership. You can look it up online. And oh, they well, brag about how they have been... Around around That's right. And what they're saying is they're so proud that they were able to impose their wishes on the U.S. government to increase the number of visa waiver countries, and they pretty much won't be done until visas are almost no longer required. They want those borders taken down. It's about profit. I spoke to a guy who testified with me on a panel about immigration and national security um, about three years ago before the House Immigration Subcommittee in Washington, and he said to me, those visas are an impediment to our business. And I said, you know, those borders and those visa requirements are our first line of defense and our last line of defense against international terrorists and transnational criminals. And he just shook his head at me and said, they have got to go. I said, well, how do you plan to protect America? They have got to go. I said, how do you want to keep the terrorists out? He said, you are impeding business, Mr. Cutler. Business is being impeded. I said, how about saving lives? He said, you don't hear what I'm saying. We need those visas to be dropped, and we need to get those borders eased up because you are impeding money and business. I said, yes, but do you know you can't take it with you? Greed over human... So that was our side conversation. Obviously, it did not happen during the hearing. I really wanted to take this guy into the parking lot for a serious conversation, if you can understand what I'm saying. Absolutely. I mean, I was in a state of rage. You know, this business about greed reminds me of a cancer. See, cancers have an insatiable appetite for nutrients. Cancers secrete hormones that force the body of the victim to grow blood vessels so that the cancerous growth can bathe itself, wallow, swim in nutrients. It takes the nutrients from the healthy tissue and it just gorges itself with all these nutrients and it's super successful. Those tumors are growing machines. They are the most successful growing cells in the whole body and they're so good at it that they succeed right up until the day that they kill the patient. And then it dies with the patient. These greedy SOBs want to bathe themselves in wealth, in opulence. It's not enough that we have a jet plane. God knows, a Learjet, ha, huh, we need a Gulfstream 5. Oh, better yet, a 757. Mansions, heck, five isn't enough. I need six mansions. And that yacht, I need two of them. Maybe it's in dry dock being fixed one day. And this rampage for uncontrolled wealth is destroying the world. Is destroying oh, the world, agree. and nobody. You're singing my song here. Well, but this is oh, common sense, angry. and exactly. so. But why is nobody paying attention? Let me let me finish reading this now. Now we're told that once we secure the Mexican border, we should be giving lawful status to millions of illegal aliens. And by the way, before I read this, I want you to think about something. I was on a program, and we talked about this off the air. 
I was on a local television program in Pennsylvania in Lehigh Valley about a month, month and a half ago. Beautiful day out there. It was great. My son was off from school, and we enjoyed driving through the mountains. And it was about airline safety. And I was on stage with a moderator, and there was this captain of a 777 uh, airliner, Delta Airlines. There was a former airport manager who was with us on stage. He had 18 years in running. I think it was Lehigh Airport. And there was another guy who called himself a libertarian. I thought he was an anarchist, frankly. Uh, you know, what can I say? But the topic was airport security and airline safety. And they allowed me to start out. I, I got to, to hit the opening around. And they said, do you think we're safe? Do you think it makes sense what we're doing works? And I said, you know, I have to seize the opportunity to bring this back to my own favorite topic, and that's immigration. I said, look, airliners are obviously an issue. We know that they want to get a hold of airliners and do damage with them. But that's hardly the only way that terrorists can kill us. You look at the Madrid bombing. You look at what happened in Mumbai, India with the terrorists. Um, you look at what happened at the Boston Marathon. No airplanes were involved in any of those attacks. Airplanes are not the only show in town. I think everybody would agree. Now, when we go to the airport, we keep getting more and more scrutiny. You know, they can actually almost combine the TSA with Obamacare at the rate that we're going. You know? Yes. Um, um, since they've really caught nobody, and I get groped every time I go through, it's... I mean, it's remarkable. At, at least if the people that groped me were good-looking women, maybe I wouldn't mind it quite so much. <laughs> you but, can't request that, I'm sure. but, uh, all, all, all joking aside, though, but I mean, think what we undergo. We have to get to the airport two hours early, so we, that means four hours on every trip gets wasted because two hours going, two hours coming. And, and you know, we get x-rayed. God only knows what problems that may create for our health down the road. But this is all done in the name of national security. We have to be secure. And if some 90-year-old man with glasses... and my luggage and, and... There you go. Now, wait a moment. <laughs> now, if some... <laughs> there's an image. But now, if, if you had some 90-year-old guy wearing glasses thick enough to stop around from a 357 looking for all the world like Mr. Magoo, if he opens the wrong door in that airport, the alarms go off, the planes come back to the gate, the airline schedule around the world goes to hell because all those flights suddenly are back at the gate and they're unloading the bag because Mr. Magoo opened the wrong door. Meanwhile, we have thousands of people every day charging the border, and we ignore it. But here's my question. You tell me, Paula, if you were at the airport and saw, let's say, a half dozen guys sneak around the TSA people and jump on board that airplane with, with backpacks, would you be willing to get on that airplane? I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it if I saw No, neither would I, because... <laughs> Right, because nobody wants to have a window seat on a cruise missile. How's that for a way of describing the concern? Exactly. So here's my question. If we wouldn't want to be on an airplane with people who evaded the inspections process, why are we being forced to live with millions of foreign nationals who evaded the inspections process that's supposed to keep criminals and terrorists out of our country? Oh, yes, with diplomatic community. No, that's not what I'm talking about. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about people that run the border. Okay. They evade the inspections process. Okay. And oh, we're told, oh, oh they're, undo they're undocumented. Well, you know, it's interesting that they use that word. I was on a debate on TV, and they said undocumented. And I said, well, you know, that's really disconcerting. Undocumented means they either don't have or they're not willing to show you their identity documents. Maybe it's because their true names are on every watch list in the world. We don't know who they are. It's not that they're just undocumented, but that they are uninspected. And people immediately will parrot the language. Well, they entered undocumented. What does it mean, entered undocumented? So if you go into a bank and you rob the bank, is that an undocumented withdrawal? Think about it. They entered undocumented. No, they entered without inspection. And then liars like Jeb Bush, who keeps looking for love in all the wrong places, claims that running the border is an act of love, but it's not a crime. Uh, and, you know, I worked with Senator D'Amato to create that act felon, the aggravated felon statute about criminal aliens who get deported and come back. If you are a person, an alien who was previously deported because you committed serious crimes and you run the border, uh, it's a felony with a 20-year maximum. 
There are not many federal laws that call for a 20-year maximum sentence. Are you going to tell me that a 20-year felony is not a crime? Jeb Bush told us that, didn't he? Because this is about an act of love. Then the conservatives... Gosh, people they people murder that don't get 20 years. <laughs> right, so understand my point. Now you got you got Ted Cruz, and he's the darling of, of, of the conservatives who are blinded by labels. This is all about labels. You've got to look for the label. Oh, he's a conservative. He's a good guy. Ted Cruz is the worst thing that could happen, as far as I'm concerned, to America. He wants to increase the number of H-1B visas for high-tech workers, programmers, engineers, scientists, technicians. He wants to increase them by 500%. We admit 65,000 a year now. He wants that number increased to 325,000. And we are being lied to. Oh, if American schools would only turn out those high-tech workers, we are turning them out. And I'm going to read something from Alan Greenspan momentarily. But before we get to Mr. Greenspan, I want to read to you about the dangers of the program by which we give lawful status to aliens. And now we're looking at page 98. Uh, no, you know what, let's start with page 47. This is the 9-11 Commission staff report on terrorist travel. Now, I want you folks to know something. The folks who take the opposite position from me are likely to refer to me as being anti-immigrant. My mother was an immigrant. My first wife died of cancer 28 years ago. Her parents came here shortly after the Holocaust as legal immigrants. Uh, it's outrageous to suggest I'm anti-immigrant. America's immigration laws are balanced. They not only tell us who to keep out and who to kick out, but they tell us who we can admit as lawful immigrants. Last year, the United States admitted more than a million lawful immigrants. They were given green cards. They were immediately placed on the pathway to citizenship. Last year, we admitted, uh, or we, we naturalized more than a half million new citizens. These numbers are greater than all the other countries on the planet combined. We gave United States citizenship under those very same laws that I want to see enforced. Those laws provided for the naturalization of hundreds of thousands of new American citizens. Those same laws provide for the granting of political asylum status to people who claim credible fear of danger if they went back to their home countries. Again, there's no integrity to the process. I'm a big fan of political asylum but it's got to have integrity so we don't wind up as we did in Boston with the Tsarnaev brothers who apparently committed fraud on their applications for political asylum. They said, we can't go back to Russia, and no sooner did they get lawful status and they went back to Russia. The House Judiciary Committee held a hearing in December of last year, and I was given the opportunity to provide questions for that hearing, and they were used. I got the privilege of sitting in my home and watching online as my questions were asked of the stooges that the administration sent over to testify. The Congress held a hearing, but to their horror, they discovered that members of the Mexican drug cartel had been granted political asylum in the United States. So understand that the system <laughs> lacks integrity, but the laws that I want enforced both are about enforcement and about benefits. They are balanced. They are balanced, and that's what I want to see. This is hardly anti-immigrant. This is about being pro-enforcement. You know, if, if you were in a rowboat, Paula, and I gave you two oars, and this is the, the, the good ship immigration, and one oar was marked immigration benefits, and the other oar was marked deportation and exclusion, and you try to row that boat, that would be fine. You have two oars, they pull equally, you have balance, and the boat gets you from point A to point B. No problem. Now imagine I took away the oar that's marked exclusion and deportation, and now you try to row with one oar, what happens? Your boat goes around and around in circles and never gets anywhere, and that's where we are today. By not enforcing the law, we lose balance, and so people violate the law with impunity, encouraging more people to violate the law with impunity. They get away by lying on the applications. So more people submit more phony applications, creating a greater workload for the adjudicators who don't have the time to properly review the documents, allowing more people to commit more fraud to get away with it. Now, you also need to know that it takes under a half hour to approve an application for an immigration benefit. 
It can take days or weeks to deny an application because now an agent has to go out and do an investigation. A report has to be written. It has to be reviewed for legal sufficiency. It's a laborious process. So when they tell the adjudicator, hey, listen, you better look for fraud because it's national security, but by the way, you better process 12 applications a day or else, how often can they deny an application and meet that quota of 12 a day? Maybe once a month? Once every two months? So all these other applications that contain fraud are going to be ignored because that adjudicator doesn't want to get a bad evaluation, which could cause them to lose their jobs. The beat is on, and the heat is on, and the pressure is on, and it's on for rubber stamping approvals into applications that have national security implications. And let me show you now just how much a part this is of national security. See, when I was on Lou Dobbs tonight, when he was over at CNN, I was on a show about 90 times. They always show those images of the aliens jumping the border, and that segment was always called Broken Borders. Yeah. There's nothing sexy about showing an adjudicator sitting at a desk with an admission stamp or an approval stamp approving application after application. <laughs> It wouldn't, it wouldn't sell papers or commercials. No, and that's right. So they want, they want the, the visual. Oh, yes. Right. Oh, they want the visual. The they want the agents. Right. So what they want is the, that image of the agents in their ray jackets, like I did for 26 years, with the battering ram, taking the door down, making the arrests, dragging people into court. That's exciting. A guy sitting at a desk going cha-chung, cha-chung, cha-chung with an approval stamp, that's boring. We can't be bothered showing that on TV. Oh, so no. people don't realize when they say, well, we need E-Verify to make sure these people have work authorization. I agree. But if we're giving work authorization to people who are lying, what's the point to the exercise? You, you see the problem? So now let me read to you. This comes directly from the 9-11 Commission staff list. report. Yes, it's all a fantasy. Now, this is on page 47 of the 9-11 Commission staff report on terrorist travel. Once terrorists had entered the United States, their next challenge was to find a way to remain here. Their primary method was immigration fraud. For example, Yusuf and Ajaj concocted bogus political asylum stories when they arrived in the United States. Mahmoud Abu Alima, involved in both the World Trade Center and landmark plots, received temporary residence under the Seasonal Agricultural Worker Program after falsely claiming that he had picked beans in Florida. Now we get to page 98. This is so crystal clear, folks. I wish you would take this little paragraph and mail it to every cement-headed member of Congress that you can and ask them why they are ignoring this and endangering our lives and national security. I want you to listen to this brief paragraph. This spells it out with such crystal clarity, and yet it will never see the light of day on any of the news networks. You will not see this on NBC or CBS News, I promise you. You certainly won't see this on ABC. Although they did talk at one point about visa fraud, but it kind of gets swept away, and they never pour it back into what this means for comprehensive reform. By the way, I wrote an op-ed for the Washington Times in 07, Senator Jeff Sessions, one of my other heroes in Washington from Alabama, and he's a conservative Republican. I'm a liberal Democrat from Brooklyn, or at least a centrist Democrat from Brooklyn, and I absolutely love Jeff Sessions. He's my hero. I wish he would run for president. Uh, I would work 24-7 without sleep to help him get elected if he made that decision. Um, I called comprehensive reform by a new name. He liked it so much, he quoted me from the floor of the United States Senate with attribution on three separate days and then sent me a certificate commemorating that hearing. I called it the Terrorist Assistance and Facilitation Act. I'm working on my candor. I don't know if I'm there yet, but I think we're getting close. This idea of giving people identity documents without being able to verify not only their names, but even their country of citizenship. Now, here's what the 9-11 Commission staff report on terrorist travel says. And now you will understand why I call this legislation the Terrorist Assistance and Facilitation Act. Okay. Terrorists in the 1990s, as well as the September 11th hijackers, am I... Uh, right. needed to find a way to stay in or embed themselves in the United States if their operational plans were to come to fruition. As already discussed, this could be accomplished legally by marrying an American citizen, 
achieving temporary worker status, think of the DREAM Act, folks, or applying for asylum after entering. In many cases, the act of filing for an immigration benefit sufficed to permit the alien to remain in the country until the petition was adjudicated. Terrorists were free to conduct surveillance, coordinate operations, obtain and receive funding, go to school and learn English, make contacts in the United States, acquire necessary materials, and execute an attack. Is that not crystal clear? Wow. Those aren't my words. That was part of the 9-11 Commission staff report on terrorist travel. It is an official government report. My question to members of Congress, why in the world aren't you looking at that document before you open your mouth and go out there for that photo op and talk about what the rights are of people who evaded the process that's supposed to safeguard us against terrorists and criminals? What do you think of that? Exactly. Now, I will give you one more statement, and this comes from Alan Greenspan, the man I love to hate. I was on a radio show the day after I watched the hearing. You can still go online. It's on the Senate website. So you can read the words, and you can see them come out of that piece of work's mouth. And this woman whose program I was on asked me what I thought about watching Greenspan deliver the testimony. <laughs> and I said it was the first time I had seen something like that before. It was really a first. She said, what kind of a first was it, Mr. Cutler? I said it was the first time they let somebody testify who was suffering from rigor mortis. I hate the guy. We should all hate this guy. He is the enemy of the American worker. He is the enemy of America's middle class. And he makes no bones about it. I'm going to read you a couple of uh, statements that he made. First, he talks about illegal immigration. Then he talks about the H-1B visas and Bill Gates, another vile character. He, start, he, he talks a bit, and then he gets to this point and says, there were two distinctly different policy issues that confront the Congress. The first is illegal immigration. The notion of rewarding with permanent resident status those who have broken our immigration laws does not sit well with the American people. No kidding, right? So he knows what the American people want. Congress knows what the American people want. And we, just like our borders, are little more than a speed bump to these bums. Okay? He goes on and says, in a recent poll, two-thirds would like to see the number of illegals decrease. But there is little doubt that unauthorized, that is, illegal immigration, has made a significant contribution to the growth of our economy. Between 2000 and 2007, for example, it accounted for more than a sixth of the increase in our total civilian labor force, meaning that they displaced American workers. If you have unemployment... And you're talking about how uh, the, uh, the uh, population of workers increased by, by a factor of one-sixth in terms of illegal aliens. Those were the jobs Americans should have had or were having until these people replaced them. Read between the lines, okay? And this was when he testified in 2009 before the bottom totally fell out. It was beginning to go at this point. And then he said... The illegal part of the civilian labor force diminished last year as the economy slowed, though illegal still comprised an estimated 5% of our total civilian labor force. Unauthorized immigrants serve as a flexible component of our workforce. Often the safety valve when demand is pressing and among the first to be discharged when the economy falters. Baloney. This is the undermining of American workers. Why do you think we have what is it, 50 million or 60 million Americans who are no longer part of the labor force? So here we have a guy who says, we know what the Americans want, too bad, too bad. And, what, and was this reported on in the news? Of course not. And, and when you listen to any network, they all, I'm sorry? And that's exactly what he Say said. Say Paul. Too bad, you know. Right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That's all that Tough. Said. Tough. Tough. He talks about Gates, 
And then he says this. Well, here, let me, let, me, let me read this a little bit more than I usually read. The quantity of temporary H-1B visas issued each year is far too small to meet the need, especially in the near future, as the economy copes with the forthcoming retirement wave of skilled baby boomers. They haven't even retired yet, but we anticipate they will. Or maybe they'll be forced into retirement, right? As Bill Gates, the chairman of Microsoft, succinctly testified before Congress in March 2007, quote, America will find it infinitely more difficult to maintain its technological leadership if it shuts out the very people who are most able to help us compete. He added, we are driving away the world's best and brightest precisely when we need them the most. So, let me understand this. Americans aren't the best and brightest? Do you mean to say that we are genetically inferior to some other people from some other part of the world? Is this not reverse xenophobia, racism, bigotry? Exactly. What do you mean you're driving away the best and brightest? Who the hell took us to the moon? Who built the Panama Canal? Who put together the atom bomb? Yes, there were people here who came from other countries, of course, but essentially these were American undertakings. What was mission impossible for the rest of the world traditionally has never been more than mission difficult for the United States. Does anybody want to argue with that viewpoint? Now, it gets worse. This is, again, Greenspan. Our skill shortage, I trust, will ultimately be resolved through reform of our primary and secondary education systems. But at best, that will take many years. An accelerated influx of highly skilled immigrants would bridge that gap and, moreover, carry with it two significant bonuses. First, skilled workers, by the way, if you folks suffer high blood pressure, take your pills, because I promise you, you're going to be experiencing difficulties in a couple of seconds. Because it makes my blood boil. First, skilled workers and their families form new households. They will, of necessity, move into vacant housing units. Tell me, Paula, is that a poetic image of an American home loss to foreclosure or what? A vacant housing unit. Amazing, isn't it? the current glut of which is depressing prices of American homes. And, of course, house price declines are a major factor in mortgage foreclosures and the plunge in value of the vast quantity of U.S. mortgage-backed securities that has contributed substantially to the disabling of our banking system. Let me interject something here, folks. It was the subprime mortgages that were concocted by Alan Greenspan that led to the disabling of our banking system. But he stood there and talked about that and talked about the derivatives uh, so that they would broaden or, or, or put the risk in across a broader spectrum so that if people defaulted, nothing could go wrong. Well, everything went wrong. And he comes back four years after he starts pushing this, this notion of subprime mortgages for illegal aliens. And if you go to the article I wrote about it, I even have the quote that he gave to the Federal Reserve Bank when he ran the Fed bragging about the subprime mortgages, bragging about it. So now here we have Greenspan telling us that we need to get foreign families into those homes to jack up the price of American homes that are now out of the reach of Americans so that the bankers can make more money. See, if we can bring more people in, that puts more pressure on the housing prices, so the housing prices go up, and Americans that don't have a house, you're not getting one anytime soon, folks. Once again, what's the message from Greenspan? Tough. Tough. But this was mild stuff. This was the salad before the main prime rib. Here comes the prime rib, boys and girls. Oh, The second bonus would address the increasing concentration of income in this country. Someone's getting too damn filthy rich. And we're not talking about Greenspan, and we're not talking about Gates, and we're not talking about Zuckerberg or Bloomberg. Guess who we're talking about? And here comes the killer. I hope that if you have blood pressure issues, you've taken your pills, folks. This will do it. Greenspan says, greatly expanding our quotas for the highly skilled would lower wage premiums of the skilled over the lesser skilled, also known as salaries. Skill shortages in America exist 
because we are shielding our skilled labor force from world competition. Quotas have been substituted for the wage pricing mechanism. In the process, we have created a privileged elite. Privileged elite. Isn't that an amazing term? I called my son up, who's a mechanical engineer, after I read this, and I said, Seth, you have a lot to be proud of. There's a new title that you should wear proudly. You may not know this, but you are now part of the privileged elite. And he finishes by saying, we've created a privileged elite whose incomes are being supported at non-competitively high levels by immigration quotas on skilled professionals. Eliminating such restrictions would reduce at least some of our income inequality. You know, before I came on the program today, Paula and I had a delightful conversation. And I, I, I gave her a sick joke because if I, if I don't once in a while laugh, uh, I, I may fall off the edge altogether. I know, because I'm, and about, I'm I, so I, angry right now. I'm about to fall off the edge. But, <laughs> yes, please lighten it up. <laughs> well, but, oh, I mean, is, is this a, but have you ever heard this on the 6 o'clock news? I, I don't watch it. Well, I, I guarantee you it's not there. Me to even, it's just, yeah, it would yes. have been there. Yes, because but no one knows event. about it. And when I speak at events, Paul, the people go crazy. And they say, we didn't know this. Absolutely. We didn't know this. So we're hearing wage equality. And by the way, I know my conservative friends are going to have a cow, but maybe it's not such a bad idea that the fast food workers make $15 an hour as a minimum wage. Because I'm going to tell you, if Greenspan and Gates and Zuckerberg and Obama... And, 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 and the right, people like Ted Cruz, if they all have their way, it's both sides. These are Republicrats, folks. They don't care about either party. If they have their way, the minimum wage will become our standard wage. Maybe the uh, trick is that workers uh, in all categories across the planet should get together and say, no, we're not going to do this anymore. See, when they say that you're anti-immigrant, because you don't want to see people exploited. I wonder if during that dark era of American history, if somebody didn't want to own a slave, if that would mean that they didn't own slaves because they didn't like black people. I don't want to see anybody exploited. And now it's so twisted that when you say that we need to secure the, oh, you don't want to hire people with brown skin. I've actually had neighbors say to me, I guess you don't like Mexicans. They said nothing could be further from the truth. Well, they're good, hard-working people. They work for me. And you know what? Oh. I pay them six bucks an hour. I pay them six bucks an hour. But for a Mexican, that's good money. And I say, really, is that kind of like white man's burden? What do you mean for Mexicans, that's good money? Oh, Why are they different from anybody else? Would you pay that to, to your friend down the block? He said, well, of course they wouldn't work for that money. So I said, okay, so is it about that you like them or that you like to exploit them and put more money in your damn pockets? And then they get real angry and they go storming off because you know you got them where they live. Absolutely. Am I right or wrong, Paula? Absolutely right. So here's the story that I told General Major General Paul Vallely. We both were in uh, South Carolina, and I got to sit next to some wonderful young ladies, and we were having dinner. And, and someone said to me, what do you think of this business about income inequality? I said, well, be careful how you get to income equality. Let me give you a good example. There's this story about this guy who's not all that well endowed. We're going to get a little off color, but only a tiny bit. I'll be careful to, to walk the tight line for you, Paula. And he's not all that well endowed, and his girlfriend is always making fun of him and, and, and making him feel so terrible about himself. And he stays up at night because he can't sleep, and he, he watches those infomercials about all these crazy things you can buy online so that you can solve the problem, you know, and it doesn't work. And he goes to a doctor, and the doctor can't help him. So one day he's so upset about his uh, <clears throat> shortcomings that he goes to the beach with his metal detector. And that's one of his favorite hobbies. He loves to walk along the beach in the nice summer and, and, and see what he can find. And he's found all kinds of trinkets and coins and an occasional ring or, or whatever. So he's out there with a the metal detector and he finds this little lantern. And lo and behold, he takes it back to his room and he starts polishing it, thinking he can get a couple of bucks for it. And a genie pops out of the lantern. And the genie says, you get one wish. And the guy is taken aback. He says, wow, a real genie, but only one wish? I thought you were supposed to give me three wishes. 
And this genie says, no, 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 you got it wrong. Maybe the other guys give out three wishes. Me, it's one wish. That's the deal. Take it or leave it. He said, so whatever it is you want, you better focus on what's the most important thing in your world. And the guy doesn't hesitate. He immediately says, listen, I know what's the most important thing in my damn world, and I want it to drag on the floor. And the genie says to him, done. And there's a flash of light, and the guy looks down, and his legs are gone. <laughs> you see, be careful how you get to where you want to be. It may not be what you had in mind in the first place. <laughs> Oh, am I wow. bad or am I bad? You're horrible. <laughs> Gosh, Mike. But I'm, I'm now, so while glad. we're talking about politicians and campaign contributions, while Absolutely. we're on a little bit of a humorous roll, <laughs> I have to throw one more at you. Okay. This is the similarities between the two oldest professions, prostitution and politics. Very similar. They all make for strange bedfellows, don't they? Absolutely. Both professions begin with a letter. Both professions begin with a letter P. Both professions involve lots of people getting screwed. In both professions, the practitioners will assume any position, no matter how ridiculous, uncomfortable, or contrary to common sense, for the right price. In prostitution, the clientele bring their fantasies that the prostitute tries to fulfill. In politics, the constituents bring their concerns, and the politicians respond by making promises they fulfill by creating fantasies. STDs can give the clients of prostitutes a case of buyer's remorse or maybe a case of something more serious, while voters may well suffer buyer's remorse when they come to find out what their elected official does once he or she is sworn into office. Talk about the gift that keeps on giving. How does that work for you? Yikes. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's too true, unfortunately. It's exactly... Hit the uh, nail right on the head with that one. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's what we. Unfortunately, with. and I'll ask you, where, ask you, where are the American people? Why aren't we questioning anything? You know, we're being told about global warming, and I was a science guy. I started studying astronomy, believe it or not, in the second grade. I started teaching it to myself. Oh, I think it's a big load of. I don't know. Well, and here's the warming, point. You know. But, but here's I my live point, in Paula. Florida. I know about warming. Okay, but here's my point. Nobody is asking the questions. John F. Kennedy had a wonderful thing that he used to say, that you judge a person's intelligence not just by the answers they give, but more importantly by the questions they ask. Do you know the biggest return we get from our space program? The next set of questions that need to be answered. Because you don't know what questions to ask until you have a certain amount of knowledge to begin with. Absolutely, that's what I'm saying. All but these no questions one's asking are coming the questions. to mind because you're, uh, you know, we didn't know it was there to ask. That's why we can't right. do these shows. Okay, so now here's my point. Here's my point, Paula. There may well be climate change. Well, we know there's climate change. Look, we, this, this planet has undergone an ice age, and then the ice shelf melted, and the, and the, and the um, uh, glaciers retreated. Humans didn't have anything to do with it. So, you know, are the, are the climates changing? They could probably be changing. They most likely are changing. But here's the questions no one asked. I was talking to a couple of, of science professors, and one professor during the course of a phone conversation said to me, do you mean to tell me you don't accept global warming, climate change, and so forth? I said, well, this personal jury, the Mike Cutler jury, is out on this. I said, see, I remember well, yeah, when I studied the, this. It's been changing constantly. That's what the Earth does, doesn't it? I mean, we, but, but, like, yes, like you said, we but went from the, an ice but, age to this age. I don't know. Right. Don't know. But now here's my question. But here's my question. I said, I remember back in school we studied the scientific method, which says that to do an experiment, you have to eliminate all of the variables except for the one variable that you're testing for. Is that right? So my question to this professor was, how many variables go into the climate? His answer was, well, we don't know what all the variables are. I said, stop. If you don't know what all the variables are, how can you eliminate all of the variables but for that one variable that you're testing for? He had no answer. Exactly. Oh my God. Now, I asked another professor about it, and he said to me, if you look at the graph, 
the level of carbon dioxide increase parallels the temperature increase, and it's a so-called hockey stick graph, if you ever saw the graph. And I said, yes, but in 1999, suddenly the data didn't go along with the model. He said, well, why did I think you were going to ask me about 1999? He said, well, my profession was that of investigator. Not about science necessarily, but, you know, criminal investigators, which is technically what a special agent is, are fact gatherers, not unlike scientists. And when you have a model that you create with empirical evidence, the model has to parallel the evidence. If the model doesn't agree with the evidence, you have to change the model, not get rid of the evidence. I said, well, what you're doing is getting rid of the evidence, because I know most graphs that they plot leave out 1999. Now, why is that? I couldn't get a good answer to that question. I said, now, there's another question that I have. What if the carbon dioxide increase was actually caused by the temperature increase, which is caused by yet something else? We don't know which is the chicken and which is the egg, which came first. Or maybe both are reacting to this other variable that we haven't even identified yet. Is that not possible? And, of course, there's no specific direct answer to that. And then if you go to the United Nations website, and this brings things full circle back to immigration also. They have said that last year, and, and the figures are all over the place, it's really hard to get the numbers, supposedly 125 or 123, I forget what the exact number is, billion dollars was wired from the United States to the foreign countries of, from which these foreign workers have come, the, both legal and illegal workers. Uh, when you look at the multiplier effect, which means that the money is just sucked out of the economy so it doesn't get to circulate, so it doesn't generate more business, that increases America's national deficit by nearly a half trillion dollars a year. That's before you look at wage suppression of American workers. That's before you look at the impact of taking American workers and moving them from middle class to poverty, where they no longer make the mortgage payments. Remember those vacant housing units where they stop paying taxes and start drawing money from the safety net programs, where they stop having disposable income so they stop making purchases of significance. By the time you're done, this probably accounts for the annual increase in America's growing national debt, which is growing now at about a trillion dollars a year. But guess what they also said would happen to increase the remittance flow because the UN wants this to happen. They're excited. They're salivating. They want the money to come out of the first world and go to the third world. And they said the two best ways to move the money from the first world to the third world, number one, the United States has to pass comprehensive immigration reform. And number two, they just, they just want sustainability. Us to share. Yeah. And the Let's other one is, is, is sustainability. Even. Oh, that is not going to work. <laughs> no, but they don't want it to be even. They want it so that the corrupt leaders of those corrupt governments think about the oil for food scandal of just two or three years ago at the UN. They are corrupt. Exactly. Power corrupt. This is the way to loot the United States and line their own pockets, folks. Does this not take your breath away? And by the way, do you want to know if the borders are secure? Do you want to know if the border is secure, Paula? I'm glad you asked that question. Yes. Is the I was on with Neil Cavuto, and Neil, and Neil said to me, well, the arrests on the Mexican border are down. That probably means there's fewer illegal aliens here. Again, going back to that mistaken notion that this is all about the Mexican border, which certainly it's not. And I said, Neil, simply looking at arrest statistics to try to figure out how many illegal aliens are present in the United States is a lot like taking attendance by asking people not present to raise their hand. How do you do that? And Neil thought it was very funny, and I got a lot of emails when I went home. Do you know, Paula, the best way to figure out if our borders are secure? How is it? How I'll give you a hint. It has nothing to do with aliens. Any ideas? Not one. Sorry. Okay. The price and availability of heroin and cocaine. Oh, my God. If our borders oh. were secure, those poisons couldn't get in. There is a heroin epidemic underway throughout the United States where first responders are now getting the antidotes to heroin overdoses. If our borders were secure, this bad. could not be happening. 
I, as as in Florida, heroin in yes. Central Florida. No, here's South my question. Florida. Did you, oh. do you see the point? Do you see my point? It, it, do you see it's my point? as easy as them picking up sand at the beach, as far as I'm concerned. So suddenly it becomes crystal clear, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Unfortunately, oh my gosh, you know. And people aren't paying attention. And you had Alan, you had uh, uh, Mayor Bloomberg when he was the mayor say two things that were the height of hypocrisy. Number one, he kept making speeches where he screamed about why the prosecutors in the Bronx, New York, were not prosecuting people who trespassed into public housing. I mean, he ranted and he raved and he lacked mouth ear coordination. His own ears couldn't hear what his own mouth was spewing. Because on the one hand, he was screaming about the need to go after trespassers. He said, if you don't go after the trespassers, we will bring back crime to America, to New York. Those buildings have to be safe. People want to know that people walking among them belong in those buildings. They want the police to ask them, who are you, what are you doing here? And you know what? He's right. But then why was it that Bloomberg wanted to give the keys to the city to illegal aliens who trespassed on America? Why is it okay to trespass on our country, but not okay to trespass in public housing? Is that not a stupendous disconnect from reality? So that was item number one. Item number two, uh, Mr. Bloomberg was out there ranting and raving about salt and sugar in the diet. We're going to get after those big gold drinks as though they were poison. Okay. So tell me, with all of Mr. Bloomberg's concerns about the health and well-being of his fellow New Yorkers, can you explain why he never talked about the dangers of drug use, of heroin or cocaine? What's more dangerous to someone's health? An extra spoonful of sugar in their coffee in the morning? Or an extra line of cocaine going up their nose? Or an extra hypodermic needle mainlining heroin into their arm? Well, you see where the money comes from, exactly. That's right. Follow the money, boys and girls. And what we are witnessing is the intentional destruction of America's middle class, because if you look at the immigration laws that they want to reform, they talk about not allowing in workers if there are Americans ready, willing, and able to do the job, that we must not allow foreign workers in if they would be likely to displace Americans or drive down wages or working conditions. That's in the law now. Most people don't know that go back to the fact as I started with, with, with you two, almost two hours ago, the time has gone quickly, the immigration laws used to be the responsibility of the Labor Department to protect the American workforce. You have Alan Greenspan talking about skills. The reason he used the term skills is to parallel the language of the Immigration Act. Okay? It was all about skilled labor. And when he talked about we've got to stop shielding, well, guess what, folks? Those immigration laws are supposed to shield us from international terrorists transnational criminals, and it is supposed to shield American workers from foreign competition. And uh, kind of like in Star Trek, um, he wants those shields down, not shields up, but shields down at one of the most perilous moments of the history of the United States of America. How is that in the best interest of our country or our citizens? It just can't be. There's just no way. And, you know, honestly, this has the time has gone by so fast. That's <laughs> so, like, gosh, I sure hope you're coming back to talk to us. Um, I'm, I'm writing yeah. down so many questions again that I know may, <laughs> may take you off a point, so I don't want to go there. But keep talking. You've got... I've got 11 minutes to share you. I'm going to take every second <laughs> of it to do it. <laughs> well, I, I want... I <laughs> thank want, you so much, Thank Mike. you. You're... you're no, you're a sweetheart. Uh, this evening on the Michael Cutler Hour on Blog Talk Radio, the USA Radio Network, I've got my good friend Don Rosenberg coming on at 7 o'clock New York time. His 25-year-old son was run down by an alien from El Salvador with no driver's license. This guy had been stopped previously. His car was taken from him in California. But guess what happened? They gave him back his car, and a couple of weeks later, Don's son is waiting at a red light. He's a law school student who decided to pay his own way through law school, even though his parents offered. And to save money, he was driving a motorcycle. The guy hits him, and according to eyewitnesses, barely injured his son. And then his son drew, as he's trying to get away from the guy or whatever, and trying to flee, the guy runs over him and crushes the kid's head, kills him. Oh, my God. 
Do you know this piece of garbage was never charged with a crime? You know, it, there's a, there goes another thing, because people that, you know, there's a degree to crimes, and there's a, a, it's a logical way. You don't have to be very smart at all to know, like, murderers and people with this history of trouble and rape or, you know, violent crimes seem to get the least But you've got a president releasing. You've got the oh president releasing gosh. thousands of criminal aliens. They don't care. We are collateral damage. It doesn't matter to them. Right here. Do you right understand now. that they are betraying their oaths of office? They are betraying the Constitution, and they're betraying the promises they made to their constituents. But I was on Lou Dobbs. It's all about creating illusions. It's all this Calais deception. Oh, the Secure Border Initiative Network. Remember the virtual fence? I was on with Lou Dobbs, and with that Lou Dobbs voice of his, Lou said to me, Mike Cutler, what do you think of the virtual fence? And I said, well, Lou, it'll do exactly what it's supposed to do. It will cost a ton of money and stop virtually nobody. It cost over a billion dollars, and I was right. The GAO came out and said it didn't work. Then why did we do it? We did it so the politicians could go back to their schmucky, dumb constituents and say, ha, I just voted to spend a billion dollars on the Secure Border Initiative Network. And everybody goes, yay, he's on our side. And everybody except the average American didn't realize that this whole thing was a sham. It's designed to do two things, put money into the pockets of corporations that probably made campaign contributions, God only knows, and create an illusion for the voters that everything is being done. But meanwhile, job one was continuing. And what was job one? Continue to flood the U.S. labor market with foreign workers to drive down the wages. And when the Republicans scream, oh, the president isn't doing his job, do you think they're really upset? No, because they want that cheap labor, too. Remember, it was Ronnie Reagan's, as we used to call them back at the Immigration Service. Most of us had a problem with Reagan. So the nickname we had from was Ronnie Reagan's. And Ronnie Reagan's um, never gave us the agents to get the job done, but he gave us the amnesty, which led to this human tsunami that we're now dealing with. And the people say to me, well, but if they've been here for the last eight years, and I got into this argument with a, with a, with a chairman of an, of, a, of an important congressional committee just about six weeks ago when I was in D.C., he said, well, if they've been here for five years, and I said, and how do you plan to figure out how long they're here? They will not have the capacity to interview them in person. They will not have the capacity to do field investigations. So you're going to rely on what they write on an application. I said, do you understand that this undermines national security, that this violates common sense, that it violates the findings and recommendations of the 9-11 Commission? If you don't know who they are, you don't know what country they're from, we know there are terror training camps in the tri-border region of Brazil, where Brazil butts with Argentina and Paraguay. We know that there are Iranian shock troops landing weekly in Caracas, Venezuela, directly from Tehran, Iran. So we don't know who's who and what's what without a scorecard, and there is no scorecard. That's what undocumented means, no scorecard. What could possibly go wrong? And this guy looked at me, and I'm colorblind, but i got to tell you, Paula, his ears were glowing red. I was basking in the warmth of this chairman's ears. I thought they were going to jump off the side of his head and fly away like two little birdies. Basking in the warmth of Now there's an image for you. I was actually hoping that they would. I wanted a picture of those ears fl fluttering out the window. Oh, gosh, when you talk about misappropriation of funds, there's a wide pool to jump into. Oh. But it's all about Washington, and it's all about illusions. Look, I, I mean, maybe it's time that we, we got a professional uh, magician to run for the presidency. At least then we would have some entertainment along the way, because they're all magicians creating illusions, with the exceptions of Steve King, uh, Lou Barletta, Jeff Sessions, um, Congress Senator David Vitter was a delight. I spoke to Vitter's guy the other day. They did a story about campaign contributions, and there's Vitter on the floor of the Senate trying to change things. A man who stands for something. But boy, oh boy, you've got to look far and wide to find out who the good guys are, and it's hard. I mean, look, when you yeah, have you Nancy Pelosi that. demonstrating the... Well, think of Nancy Pelosi's chutzpah, as we say in Brooklyn. You won't know what's in the health care bill till after you vote on it. 
would you buy a car or a refrigerator that way? Yeah, we've got that car under that tarp in the corner of the showroom. Can't show it to you. Can't tell you the color or how many doors or if it's a stick or an automatic. But don't worry. You're going to love it. We're going to put it in your driveway. Oh, and I can't tell you what it's going to cost till you take the tarp off, but that won't happen till you sign here so it's yours. Would you buy a car like that? Why was health care sold to us that way? And they did it, and nobody ever said a word. And I guarantee you that the American people are dumb enough that they will reelect Nancy Pelosi. I'm, I will guarantee oh, you please. that the idiots oh. will give her another, t another shot at, at, at doing to us what she's been doing to us right along. I mean, I know the American people like to have sex, but we're getting screwed by these politicians, but there's no sex involved. No, no dinner or phone call after either, babe. Nope, not at all. Wham, bam, thank you, ma'am. What was your name again? <laughs> Am I crazy? That, that's it. Um, no, you're right on the money right there. Ugh, it's it's angering. It's Solutions are what we need for all of this. And I know you have plenty of uh, to say about that as well. I hate that we're well, so... Well, it starts you know, with enforcement. It starts it with enforcement. It seems like you've been it here starts... 15 minutes, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. It's been fun, hasn't it? It's been a... Did I, did I keep my promise and not turn into an unlicensed anesthesiologist? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Thank goodness. I, no, I, I knew after just talking with you briefly that I have to get this guy on the air. Well, and I, and I said, you know, and you. he's going to, one thing a white radio does, it, it, someone's always going to get upset, and that makes people look into things. And that's exactly what's got to happen. People you know, have there was a to great radio. hear something, get upset, and start digging to try to prove it wrong. And a lot of times, they end up with the reverse of what they think. And it's because well, that's what's gonna happen here. everybody is so laxed and so, you know, uh, laid back. But we are constantly getting, uh, especially stations, I'm sure all over the world, about... I'm losing my home. I, I just lost a job I had. Yep. I'm 50 something years yep. old. You know they're not hiring anyone. I've been looking, and we're we're getting the down and outs big time. And then you say, "Oh my gosh, we got three minutes." Then you talk about uh, uh, Terry Anderson, an one of my favorite talk across, shows. You know, uh, I'll just give you a quick quote. I got to give you a quick quote. You said about being angry. One of my favorite talk show hosts, a man I was so proud to consider a friend, he passed away to cancer a couple of years ago, Terry Anderson, big raucous black guy from California. He used to call himself the uh, prisoner of South Central L.A. He used to start the show by roaring into the microphone. He used to wear these bib coveralls. He would crack me up, and we spoke at events together all over the country. And he said, if you ain't mad, you ain't paying attention. If you ain't mad, you ain't paying attention. There you go. And I am paying attention. Go to my website, by the way. It's michaelcutler.net, one word, C-U-T-L-E-R, michaelcutler.net. Or, or go to the capsweb.org website. They do a great job of getting information out there. I'm one of many people who write for them. But, but I thank you so much for having me on your show this, this afternoon, Paula. Oh, just promise you'll come back. Please, Mike. I'll come Love back. I'll come back. You. And it's just, it's just amazing. Thank you for sharing everything that you've done. And... There'll be uh, hopefully some marks on your website to show that uh, people are paying attention. Well, certainly reach me, michaelcutler.net. Love to hear from you. You can contact me through that website. Um, you know, I do debates all over the United States, and what I find is when you go on college campuses, the people who think that you're their enemy quickly realize that they've been lied to, and boy, do they get pissed. And boy, does that make me smile. As I told Jim Sensenbrenner, Brenner, the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, if I can't sleep at night, sure as hell I don't want you sleeping at night either. Absolutely. <laughs> I wonder how many times I've said that today, but um, it's been great having you. This is well, Mike thank you, Cutler. Ma yes, and thank you. Yep. We'll be hope to hear from you again soon. And uh, have a wonderful right, day. Thank you so much. Shoot your, your phone number to me where I can reach you, and I'll talk to you off the air. But have a wonderful weekend, everybody. But you know what? Democracy is not a spectator sport. If you're angry, do something about it. Those politicians are lonely, and they need to hear from you. Oh, yes. The telephone works both ways. Email you them. You betcha. Talk to them. Go down there and see them. <laughs> <laughs> Tell them we're not as stupid as they hope we are. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Thank you so much. Mike Cutler, you guys. Be well. Have a great weekend, everybody. All right. Thank you.